morning. Well, good evening. Uh, welcome to the passage at Crossroads Christian Church. Welcome if you're watching us online. And I just want to begin with a, a question tonight, and that is, everybody in good spirits? Everybody in good spirits? All right. That's good, because we should be. Um, we win. We win. Your candidate may not win, but your candidate may win. And it doesn't make any difference. We win. I, I'll tell you something. I was going to say this for a little bit later, but I'm going to tell you. I dressed up today, and I dressed up for a reason. I dressed up because we can celebrate that all the crap is over. And I mean that because it's, it's one of the most frustrating things as a church leader to know that in this nation the church is divided, and it should not be. And so I, I actually... Uh, I kind of talked about that, this today with a couple of people. Robbie, I, poor Robbie, I went in and talked his ear off. Um, but, but I'm celebrating because now we can get back on track of what we're supposed to be doing. See, I, I think, personally, I'm not saying it's a bad thing at all. By the way, if you were here yesterday, you would, you would have seen on my, on my uh, sweatshirt that I voted Okay, but here's, here's why, I mean, this is my, my whole frustration with it all. You know, we, we, were, we were trying to build some good relationships with, um, you know, with other congregations, and, and we have built some great relationships with other congregations. And then the election comes along. And I'm sorry, folks, but the issue with the election is that every four years, the church takes a step backwards in their unity. And, and they do. We do. And, and so one of, the, one of the groups I was talking to today, I, I shared this. One of the issues in, in our, uh, as leadership is that there are church leaders and there are pseudo-church leaders. I hope you know what I mean by pseudo-church leaders. They call themselves the church but they are anything but preaching the gospel message and building and making disciples. You know, I, I hate the fact, I hate this fact, that there are preachers who stood in their pulpits, they stood in their pulpits, and they made declarations about who you should vote for. It's, it, it's, first of all, it's unlawful. But for some reason, they get away with it. And, and I'm sorry, but if it if it you know if it if it upsets some, some people uh, who do that, then they need to be upset. In fact, what they need to do is repent. And 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 so anyway, tonight I just thought as we look, we begin to look at Joshua. Man, what a perfect message! What a perfect message to begin the work that we're supposed to be doing, which is building the kingdom. All right, And so there in Joshua chapter 1, verse 1, it reads this way. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you just as I promised to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon as far as, as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. So be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to the, all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left 
that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened, and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Amen? Amen. And, and so, you know, getting back to it, and, I, and I, man, I know that sometimes I get a little strong with some of the stuff, but I'm telling you, I am excited. I am excited that we can focus on the things that we're supposed to be focusing on, all right? Even within a change of leadership. Th th this passage begins with what some call the, the commissioning of Joshua, all right? And, and here's what we know coming into the book of Joshua. Moses, God's servant, has died, and now there is an opening, okay? And, and so, how, you know, how many of you, I'll just ask this, how many of you have worked in places where there was a change of leadership? So let me ask you this. <laughs> My wife just snickered because she works for the federal government. Let me ask you this. <sighs> what often happens when there's a change of leadership? What's that? Everything changes. Everything changes. Y'all remember whenever, uh, who was it, Bill Clinton, when he left office, wasn't it Bill Clinton when he left office that he took all the W's out? That all the staff took all the W's off of the, off the typewriters because it was George W. Bush who was coming in to, you know? I, I actually worked in a plant that closed, and so I know what happens sometimes is that as there's a transition of things, people sabotage things for example. And uh, so, so the point is, is oftentimes when leadership changes, there's a lot of chaos, isn't there? And there's a lot of messing around, okay? And, and so let me share you a, a truth concerning God's lead, leadership. There may be a change in God's instrument, but if they are his leaders, then leadership does not change. And you know why? Because it is God who's in the lead. And, and, and that, that is the point God is making to the one who is up next in leading Israel. That's what he's saying to him. The plan hasn't changed, right? And, and, and so I was listening to a message today by Pastor Crawford Loritz. And he was preaching to a group of church leaders back in 2008. And, and oh, if only... The church leaders had heard his message and listened and applied it. Things might be different even today. But, but anyway, he's preaching, and, and, and he shared that while people, while we, are emotionally distraught oftentimes at a change in leadership, God isn't. He sees the big picture, and when an effective leader dies is caught in some sort of sin, because we've seen that as well. I mean, effective leader, and then they sin, and they fall, right? Or if that person retires, Charles Stanley this year, you know, retired. Uh, he is preacher emeritus or something like that at, at the, the church that he serves. Or, or if, some, if they're replaced in some other way, God simply calls out, and I love this, I mean, follow this. Because the illustration that Laura used was this. Um, when Billy Graham died, man, there were a whole lot of people who were sad. Because one of the greatest preachers to have lived in the 20th century and preached in the 20th century and 21st century, as far as that goes, passed away. But Laura says this, God wasn't up in heaven going, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? He simply turned and he called out, Next! And, and, and seriously, I've been thinking about that a lot. Part of it is because every year I'm going, I'm going to be 58 years old. And that's, I mean, I get people in our congregation sometimes who say that you're just a youngster. <laughs> right? 
will live in my body for a little bit. Right? So I'm 58 years old. I've preached, man, what have I preached? 36 years? 36 years I've preached, you know. Now, not all of it was in a congregation in a located place, but we've been here for 21 years. In January, it'll be 22 years that we've been here. And so I've started thinking a lot. You heard me use the illustration that I talked to Lynn Laughlin one day. I said, Lynn, I am just trying to do the least amount of damage with what I have left to finish well. And then I listened to that sermon today by Lawrence. You ought to go back and listen to it. I've, I've borrowed some of it tonight, okay, just so you know. But you need to hear him preach this message because it'll stir you. He says, quit talking about the regrets because that's not where you're going. And man, I believe that. I mean, he reinforced that in me um, today as I listen. But I love that illustration of when we wring our hands because someone retires, someone is replaced. I mean, even if someone falls, that congregation needs to understand that God has someone that he can turn around and say, who's up next? And as Christians, we also need to understand that, right? Um, because we're all going, as long as Jesus tarries and, and, and the Lord doesn't come back, we are all going to go that way of death. Yes. Uh, yes. Crawford, C-R-A-W-F-O-R-D, Loritz, L-O-R-I-T-T-S. I'm not going to get sidetracked here, but I'll tell you, one of my favorite parts of it, he's talking about his dad. His dad was a man of faith, too, and Crawford uh, says about his dad, that his dad taught him this lesson, that you do not walk away. Now, one of the things that I'm so very, in a good way, that I'm so very proud of, there have been a number of times when I've wanted to walk away in ministry. And I'm sure there have been a number of times, maybe some of y'all have wanted to walk away from here, but you haven't, and I haven't. And, and I was telling Robbie today uh, used to, the calls would come in and I'd get offers to go somewhere else and those calls have long since passed. I think, I think they watch me on YouTube and say, uh-uh. Uh, actually, what I think has happened and I know has happened is that when you say no often enough, they finally get the message that you don't want to go. I've always felt like, we have always felt like, as difficult as ministry and life has been, we have always felt like that God wants us in Danville, Illinois. I'll never forget Emily saying to me one time, saying to us, we had friends who were moving here. Jonathan Nolan, who was the youth minister at Northland. Mike Whittle, Mike and Wendy, uh, the, the preacher at Old Union. Uh, Danny Schaffner. And it was when the Schaffners left that Emily said, what's so big about Danville? And yet God placed us here. What was that? <laughs> now it was a good group of people and a good mix most of the time. It was a good mix. And so things happen. And I am here to tell you tonight that the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come in this community because the church is beginning to work together. Oh, there's some that are trying different things, but the church is beginning to work together. I, I can't share with you my dream right now, but I have a dream for Danville, Illinois. I really do. So in our text, I mean, what's happening? Joshua is next. Moses has died. Joshua is next. There's one thing that is particularly, I, always, I hate that word. There's one thing that's brought forth 
in chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. And that one theme is this, courage. Courage. Pastor Lord states that this is the best leadership text in the Bible, and it is not for the faint-hearted. I like that. The pastor goes on to say, it's like God reaches out. I mean, you know that it's God speaking to Joshua, right? It says that at the very beginning. It's the Lord. He didn't have a vision. He didn't have a dream. The Lord directly came to him. And it's like the Lord reached out and grabbed Joshua by the lapels. And he said to him, Be courageous. I remember remember when I coached football at Bismarck, (laughs) oftentimes, and sometimes there there were some players that resented it, but most of them understood. I would grab them right here on their shoulder pads. Now, that was kind. When I was playing football, they'd grab you by the face mask, shake you around a little bit. But I would grab these boys by their shoulder pads, and I would pull them into me. And in my, in my mind, that is exactly what God is doing with Joshua. It is a God moment for Joshua. If you want, you could put it in these terms. It's a dad moment for Joshua, and he, or for, for God and Joshua. Dad pulls him in and says, Son, I want you to be courageous. So, that's how God is in situations like this one. He doesn't, he doesn't coddle us. But instead, he tells us to be courageous. And so I just want to share with you tonight, this is a sermon I'm probably going to preach again. I hope that I preach again. I hope I preach it to some of our pastors and leaders in this community. But what... What this does, verses 1 through 9, is it presents a fourfold description of what courage looks like. Well, first of all, courage rests upon a clear assignment from God. And in verses 1 through 4, God lays out a clear assignment for Joshua. I mean, the, the task is clear. God says, I want you to enter into this land, and wherever your foot may tread, that land will belong to you. It's yours. And so go and inherit it. Inherit it. Now here's the deal. His mission was the same mission that had been placed on the shoulders of Moses. You know that, don't you? Moses wasn't just supposed to lead the people of Israel out of slavery. But Moses was to deliver them into the promised land. But Moses had a disobedient moment and a pretty serious one because he took the glory from God. And so God disqualified him from fulfilling what he had purposed. I mean, Moses was to be the one to do it. And by the way, that's not an unusual theme in the Old Testament. You know that David, God gave David the plans for the temple. But do you realize that David couldn't build the temple? Why couldn't he build the temple? He was a warrior. God said, I don't want that person to do it. He gave the plans to him. He saw it. I mean, he he understood it. He even began, hey, listen, David even began to bring in the materials for it. But he could not build it, right? How about Saul? I mean, Saul was the first king of Israel, and he's removed because of his disobedience. God says, I mean, God says, I want him, I want him dead. And, and so, or, or even Israel divided because of Solomon's idolatry. I mean, you know that, don't you? The, the nation divided because some chose uh, to rebel against Solomon. Because of his idolatry from building the temples and the worship spots for his many his many wives. And so it's not an unusual thing. You know, the point is that 
God's instrument had changed. And while the people mourned the loss of Moses, God steps in and he's preparing a new leader in Joshua. And so here's a question I was thinking about through the text. Was Joshua the leader that Moses was? I mean, was he? So here's how I answered yes and no. On the no side, I said this. On the one hand, he's probably not the leader that, that Moses was. If you remember what Exodus 34.10 said about Moses, it said, And there has not arisen a prophet since in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. I think we even repeated that last week, didn't we? There's not been a prophet that's been risen up or has been arisen um, who was like Moses. And so on one hand, no, he wasn't the, he wasn't the, the leader that, that Moses was. And by the way, this is interesting to me, Joshua is probably the one that wrote that down. I mean, it was probably Joshua who finished the book of Deuteronomy, and so that he probably wrote that about Moses. On the other hand, Joshua was the leader that God chose. You see, God is not in need of worthy men. It is God himself who makes men worthy. I'm going to repeat that, and there's a reason I'm repeating it. God is not in need of worthy men, but it's God himself who makes men worthy. Why is that important for us right now? Because possibly we're going to have a change of leadership. And, and, and I understand, there, there may even be someone here who voted for um, Biden, you could have voted for Trump. Quite frankly, I don't care who you voted for. Because God is not a need in need of worthy men. It is he who makes men worthy. You want, you want an answer for why Paul says that we should pray for our leaders? Because only God can change their hearts. Only God can change their hearts. And he is quite capable of doing it. And the other part to that is this. Was Joshua the kind of leader that Moses was? No. But yet, yes, because he is the one God chose. May I remind you that whoever our candidate is, or, or whoever our president becomes, that, and we learned that in February or so, I mean, seriously, I mean, you know what's going to happen. Either one of them, whoever wins, the other is going to contest it. They're not going to concede. And it's just going to be a mess for months. I mean, it is. But you know what? It's okay. Because the one who goes into the presidency eventually in 2022, the one that goes into that position has been chosen and placed there by God. And so Paul says, pray for them. Why do we pray for them? That the Holy Spirit would penetrate their heart and their mind. All of our leaders could use prayer. I mean, Jennifer pointed out, and this is a wonderful, it has been, in 2022, it will be 50 years. It has been 48 years since Roe versus Wade. And during presidencies, during their terms, uh, pro-life presidents, you know, pro-life Supreme Court, it has not been overturned, folks. But the, and the good news is that our God is still on the throne. And so we, we speak against those kinds of issues. In fact, to me, that's the biggest issue. 
So we speak to it. And, and, and we ask forgiveness as a nation for it. Christians are, are, are pleading with God that this nation would be forgiven of that kind of thing. God's going to deal with those people someday. And, and, and so um, coming back, i got to come back. The, po- the point is, whoever is in the position, they don't always have the control. I mean, seriously, right now, let's say Biden wins, the Biden wins, the Republican Senate balances some of that out. That's, that's the games that people play. Our job as Christians is to pray for them because God has placed them there so that they will have a conscience and they will have a heart. It is not, God is not in need of worthy men. It is he who makes men worthy. We are his instruments. And and if we are obedient to his mission, that's all he needs, our willing instruments. And and, and I don't, I mean, let me ask, do you believe that? Do you believe that what all that he needs is someone who's just simply willing to step out? I hope so, because at one point, God used Balaam's ass to speak the truth. And if he can do that, he can use us. By the way, that's a joke that if you go and listen to him, he's going to tell. So that's a point I stole. So brothers and sisters, Joshua has a mission, and we've been told what the mission is. Enter into the land. Prepare the people. Enter into the land. And so, do you, I mean, you all realize that we have a mission too, right? I mean, you all know that. And and it's not putting a particular person in the White House. Praise God that we're not a congregation who, who that's what we focused on. Some did, and they're wrong. I've already kind of covered that, but I just, I, I want to repeat it. Our purpose is not to put a particular person in the White House. Or as mayor of Danville, or uh, we, 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 we exercise our, our constitutional right to vote, to speak, to, to give our opinion of who should be there. By the way, in the state of Illinois, if you vote Republican, people say, well, it's a wasted vote. No, it's not. Uh, the popular vote sometimes counts, too. And so we speak. We, we vote. I guess, never mind. So we have this mission, and it's not that. So can you tell me what our purpose is? What is the purpose of the church? To make disciples. To bring people to a point where they encounter God. To to bring them to a point where they are equipped by God. And so that we can send them out and they can emulate Jesus Christ. And it's right over there. I mean, it's it's bringing people to his presence. It's becoming a community of people. And then exercising what God's passion is, what his mission is. And his mission is to make disciples. He wants us to make disciples. Why does he want us to make disciples? Because the more disciples that are made... Uh, the more that the kingdom heaven, of heaven grows and, and the more people who are rescued from their sin and death and we celebrate that together in heaven one day. And so that's our mission. Man, can I just tell you, we have been so confused about what our mission is. Along the way, we, we help a little bit with, with marriages. Along the way, we will help with people who are dealing with blended families. Along the way, we will help with people who have addictions. Along the way, we will help people who have unbelief. But, but the whole goal is to bring them to the point where they are solid. And for the past couple of months, that's not been the focus of the church as a whole. It's our purpose. Another part of the purpose is to complete the good works that God has prepared in advance for us to do. Ephesians 2.10 
For we are God's workmanship, created for the good works that He has prepared, that He has laid out. And if we're walking with Him, then He's going to reveal those things to you. Can I tell you something? It might just be a word of kindness. It might be that the gas station attendant that, that you've dealt with you know, for years, a few years, that you decide to hand him a $10 bill and say, I hope you have a good day. And, I, and I'll tell you what will happen. They'll look at you like, are you nuts? You want me to have that? And I'm telling you, I don't always do that, but if I feel like God is speaking to me to do that, I do that. Because I think of Ephesians 2.10. It may be opening the door for some. I'm serious. I mean, we have so overcomplicated what it means to evangelize. It can be sitting down with someone that's a co-worker and you just listen to them for a time. You were doing a good work in them. We have so overcomplicated it. And that's one of my goals at the beginning of the year, by the way, because we're going to be looking at the Great Commission. And we're specifically going to be looking at families because here's what I don't think a lot of families realize. When you raise your children, do you know how many times in the last 24 hours I have heard people say to me, I am just so worried for my kids and my grandkids. Well, if you are, then you better start teaching them. Because it's your responsibility. Not mine. My responsibility is to equip you. Now, my, my uh, responsibility is also to lead by example. Okay, Just like some other leaders who are in here. We're to lead by example. And so we teach them. Do you not realize that that's exactly what Israel did? Uh, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Talk about it as you walk along the road. Listen, I just I mean, let me illustrate it in this way. I had the opportunity um, this past week, uh, Jennifer and I was picking the boys, not just this past week, it was, what day was it, Monday? Pick up the boys off the bus. All right, so Monday, I pick the boys up off the bus, and they, they beg me, can we stay here so that our friends can come over? And so I said, yeah, we'll, we'll do that. I'll call mom, grandma, and granny, and I'll call mom. And so I, I called them. I said, is that okay? They said, that's fine. And so Maddox, he, he runs off, and he goes down to Tiff's house uh, to play with Levi. Um, uh, uh, Ryland came over to play Fortnite with, with Riker, and, and right there, I immediately had an issue. Sorry. I immediately had an issue. Because there's two dogs in the cages inside, and they're barking, and they need to go out. And my grandsons are at an age where they're old enough to take care of that. And Papa shouldn't have to take care of it. So I told him. L listen, we are willing to, to do that to lead our children. Why aren't we willing to sit down and read them a story from the Bible? I mean, why aren't we willing to kneel beside their bed? And maybe some of y'all did that. To kneel beside their bed when they're sleeping and to pray over them. Because that, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, that is the act of making disciples. See, I'm telling you, uh, things are going to squeeze in on the church. They are. And, and as I'm replaced as a leader and as you're replaced as you know, a parent or grandparent, not replaced, but as you were uh, removed, the, the hope that we have is that we have, we have taught our children well. Crosby, Stills, and Nash. Teach your children well. And that makes disciples. 
right? We have so overcomplicated. So I'm looking forward to the beginning of the year because that's what we're going to be talking about. And that is our mission, to make disciples, to complete the good works that God lines up for us. You know, Have you ever wondered why you come along at just the right time when someone is in need because God is presenting an opportunity for you? Courage also rests upon the assurance of God's presence. Look again at verses 5 and 9. God says to Joshua, No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Verse 9, Have I not commanded you? Is it not me who's speaking to you, God says? So the children of Israel who come to their destination, they are, they are, in the, are on the verge of entering the promised land, the location which was dedicated first to be the home of Abraham's descendants. I mean, this goes back generations. It goes back 500 years or so that the promise was originally made that your descendants, who will be as numerous as the stars and as numerous as the grains of sand you know, that are along the beach, your descendants will live here. And so they're on the verge of entering in. And so the question is, do you really think that God would leave Joshua high and dry? I mean, we know the story, Right? And so as we tell the story, we know, we would say, that's ridiculous. God is going to step in. It reminds me of some of the old cartoons I used to watch, you know. Um, And I don't even remember. Some of them were so old, I don't know the characters in them. But I remember, you guys remember the one where the guy would always take, oh, man, what was his name? Dastardly, Dastardly? What is it? All right. So anyway, he would take the the young woman, he would tie her up, and he would put her on the railroad track, and all of a sudden, the hero would come along and rescue. I mean, do you? Do, of course, God isn't going to drop Joshua. So so let's piggyback on that for today. Why in the world would we think that God would uh, drop us? His history has been that he's always faithful. God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He is the one in whom we place our hope and trust. He is the one who preaches, or preaches, who provides our courage. I mean, I don't know if you get that or not. He just simply wants you to be willing. Let me give you a quote that Crawford Lawrence uh, said, because I believe this is true. I believe this is true with all of us. Courage doesn't mean that I'm not afraid. It means that I fear God more than I fear my environment. It means that I trust in divine resources more than the resources of man. The rescue comes from God. You remember when Dan died, one of the things that I said was, I kept, well, I preached in his his funeral message, is what got us back together was to understand that. The battle belongs to the Lord. The battle belongs to Him. Courage doesn't mean that I'm not afraid. Courage doesn't mean that you're not afraid. It means that we fear God. Adonai, Master. The fear of Adonai is the beginning of wisdom. And unfortunately, there are people who call themselves the church who fear their environment more than they fear God. And those people need rescued. It means that we trust in what he gives more than what man gives. That's Crawford Lords. Philip Brooks said this, and I hope, and I hope this opens a good can of worms, okay? Phillips Brooks said this, Don't ask for task equal to your powers. Ask for powers equal to your tasks. 
And as a church, as Crossroads, we've stopped doing that. You know? And, and that's what the church has kind of turned into. We do these evaluations. We do these, these, uh, these giftedness tests. Where do I fit? I mean, God doesn't take the time to examine Joshua that way. He simply comes along and says, Joshua, I want you to lead. I want you to be bold and courageous, strong and courageous. You're going to need strength and you're going to need courage. And guess what? Where you're going to get it is from me because you know who I am. Folks, I have been preaching the names of God. And I, and I know you all get this, but maybe somebody out there who tunes in at some point and listens to part of this and maybe gets into it, I get to tell them. We have been listening to the names of God because it is important that we know who He is, not about what we are and how we are gifted, but how God wants to use us. And so, let me go back. Phyllis Brooks says, don't ask for task equal to your powers. Ask for powers equal to your task. We've had some dreams here that we need to rekindle. We need to restoke. Thirdly, courage rests upon focused determination. Focused determination. <laughs> That's digging in, right? Right? Three times in these verses, 6, 7, and 9. 6, 7, and 9. Three times in these verses, God repeats this phrase, be strong and courageous. Verse 7, be very strong and courageous. Verse 9, is it not I who has called you? So therefore, be strong and courageous. So obviously, you probably don't need to ask this question, but where does strength and courage come from? Where does strength and courage come from? It comes from God, right? I mean, forget the personality tests. It doesn't make any difference if you're an A-type personality or a D-type personality or even a Z type personality. I've met a few Z type personalities. I think you know what I mean. They're the ones that just sit there. And that's none of you, by the way. When God calls us for a task, He will be the one who equips us. Amen? Let me say it again. When God calls us for a task, He will be the one who equips us. I mean, I I always think of Jesus telling the disciples, listen, if you get hauled into court, you get arrested, don't fear about what you will say because the Holy Spirit will take over. I'm going to tell you, I know I've talked about this before, but it's a great illustration of this. When we met together as Old Union and Northland, as the leadership, right? I mean, we met right up there, right up front, about where... The playground area is. And I remember coming in here, and I think it was Brian who whispered to me, it's like, it's like a mafia meeting. <laughs> and it kind of was. We had cars outside and a table and some plastic chairs. Maybe they were steel chairs. And we all sat down together. And by the time we got home, everybody knew about it. I'm serious. Somebody had gone by. They looked up. They saw Tim Carter's car here, they saw Mark Pittman's car here, then they saw Tom Ebert's car here, or they saw Terry Goodner's car here, or Jeff Lane's car here, or my car here, and they noticed that Doug was here too, right? And they spread the word, something's happening. And something was happening, the Holy Spirit took over. And I'll never forget that night of that meeting. We stood in the nursery of the Northland building, and I was soaked with sweat because I was so anxious. And we prayed together. We joined hands and we prayed together. It was before COVID. <laughs> we prayed together. By the time we were done, I wasn't sweating anymore. And I, stopped, I stepped out on that. I had been selected. See, the reason I was sweating is because I had been selected to entertain 
the answers or entertain the questions that would be coming in from the people of Northland. And some of them weren't really questions. Accusations, you're right. Declarations. And so I got up there, and, and I, I'll be honest with you, I, mean, I remember some exchanges. I remember one person, I won't mention her name, because I do res- I respect this person, but they mentioned that all we were in it for was the $150,000 that Northland had saved up. And so I just answered, I don't know where it came from. We hadn't discussed it. I just said this, well, if that's a hang-up, then spend it, right? I mean, $150,000 would have done some things, you know. We might have had something a little more fancy in here. But God led me to say, spend it. And I'm serious on that. He took over and there wasn't an anxious bone in my body. And so the promise is true. I think of that promise all the time. He is going to give you what you need. Well, they might ask me a question that I don't, I don't know. Well, then tell them you don't know. I mean, so anyway, Mo, I mean, let, let's, let's look at Moses' example. You know, Moses did everything he could to get out of leading Israel out of Egypt And God reassured him that he would be with him. And God reminds Joshua the same thing. I am with you. Joshua, remember that. And so uh, Lawrence goes back. He says, Joshua must have in that moment gone back and thought about, man, I remember Moses raising his staff at the Red Sea. I mean, you realize that was probably, I mean, it was 40 years prior And he remembered it. Which, by the way, kind of sparked something for me. Because one of my frustrations with the church today, (laughs) that was good. (laughs) Because I remember one time at Old Union, you called me. (laughs) But you know something? I mean, I've I've listened to thousands of sermons and there have been times <laughs> there have been times there have been times when I thought that someone used an illustration that was out of date and even on Sunday I made mention that I was using an illustration from 1998 right and some preachers would say well that's way too old you know and, and we do the same thing with our music And it frustrates me because not all old music is irrelevant. I walked in there today. Well, I'll get to that in a minute. But I'm going to tell you about going to a prayer meeting in just a minute. But I walked in there and the song that she was playing was My Tribute. My Tribute was a song from the 70s by Andre Crouch. How can I say thanks for the thing? that you've done for me. You want to take over? (laughs) (laughs) To God be the glory. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. For the things he has done. Man, if that song isn't relevant right now, right? And so I thought, man, this is cool. And, and I wanted to go over and say, you know, I've sung most of my life. But I didn't do that. But, 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 but anyway, you, you get the idea, right? God is going to give you what you need. And so I want to ask you just a, a couple of more questions tonight, church. Isn't it time that we determine to collectively fulfill what you and I are called to do in Danville, Illinois? You agree? It's time, right? I mean, isn't it time that we obey the desire of God? And what is his desire? What is his passion? It is mission. And it's one mission. To make disciples. And along the way, we do these good deeds. Well, why do we do the good deeds? To get their attention. 
so that we can make disciples. And so it's time that we, that we step out. And I know right now, in this moment, even the people online, I'm kind of preaching to the choir. But here's what I want to build. I am not preaching in such a way, and I don't think you feel that I'm preaching in such a way, where I am, in con- am condemning any of us. I'm trying to pump us up. We have a purpose, and we have a mission, and it's about time that we get on with it. And so I celebrate that some of this stuff is over. It's not solved yet. But I celebrate that it's over so that you and I can get back to our purpose. And not just us, but other congregations here in town. So that we can serve together in Vermilion County. So that we can be missionaries in Vermilion County today together. I talked about the prayer meeting a little bit, but I want to tell you something else about it. See, the thing is, where I got hit today was that Crawford Lawrence said to the group of people that were listening, and, and as I was listening, whether it's, what is that, 12 years later, I'm a part of the group he's talking to. And what he said was, God has been laying some things on your heart. You just need to act on it. And he says, some of y'all, God has laid things on your heart, and you just kind of try to push it off. You're like Moses. You may be like Joshua. No one, no one, Joshua doesn't share his opinion in here, okay? He shares it later. But, but the, the, the point being is that I went to that prayer meeting today, two weeks ago. I'd already heard about it. Chelsea had brought me the book. Um, he's following a pattern from 1857 in New York City. And I believe it started the Second Great Awakening um, in, in our nation. This prayer group coming together at noon. Stay for five minutes, stay for ten minutes, stay for twenty minutes, or stay the whole hour. But the point is, when the hour's done, the hour's done. And so I had already gotten the book. I kind of thumbed through it and read it a little bit and, and the invitation, the flyer. Didn't know who this guy was. Well, I met him today. And part of it was, I'll just mention that in one of the Bible studies that, was going on, that goes on here, uh, Carol Finley asked me. She saw it in the paper, right? It wasn't in the newspaper, right? And so she asked me, have you been to this? I said, no, but I've thought about going to it. See what, see what I'm saying? God had laid it on my heart. I've thought about going to it. And so she started talking to the ladies. Well, maybe one day we'll do this, and and then we'll go down there. And so I, you know, that was two weeks ago. So today, I listened to Crawford, and, uh, man, what happened? Hmm. I happened to think that they were going to be praying at noon. And I thought I was pretty much prepared, you know, for tonight. And so I thought, you know what? I have time for this. And can I just challenge? Some of y'all may have time for this. I know I'm talking Southern. I don't know why I'm doing that. But some of you may have time for it. And I'm going to be calling some church leaders this week. And I'm going to tell them, you may not think you do, but you have time for this. Why? Because I'm determined. Man, I'm determined. I'm determined in the next four years. This wasn't even my notes. But I'm determined in the next four years to unite the church as best that I can, whether it ticks some people off or not. So I will work with any biblically centered, and I stress that, biblically centered congregation to promote unity in the church. And I am determined that for the remainder of my ministry here to faithfully and passionately commit to equipping our part of the kingdom, to equipping crossroads for carrying out the Great Commission. And I will do that by setting the example. See, I'm determined to be strong and courageous because I want to trust Adonai my master. 
Finally, and we're almost done. God's word, or God's courage, is anchored by the word of God. You probably already realize that, but in verses 7 and 8, this is how they read. It says, um, it says, Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may go you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be may be careful to do accord to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Prosperous and good success. It is not about health and wealth. It is about being in good standing with our Lord. Amen. And, and honestly, I mean, I, I, I'm not going to take the time to share this illustration, but if you want to ask me afterwards, it gets me that what, what God says to, uh, to him is do not turn to the right and do not turn to the left. And all I'll say about that is this. The mess that we have in the church are those who are on the right and the left. I don't, I don't mean conservatism. I mean ultra conservative, where, where you're locked into tr- to tradition. Your idea is that, that we're going to go back and we're going to be this church. It, and folks, it's too late. We have to focus on the kingdom. This country is not going to come back to God. But we can build the kingdom and bring people into and introduce them to him. And I think that's what so many people misunderstand. It's it's not just a problem on the left. It is those who are locked into tradition of what this nation should look like. And it's too mixed up now. So, not being unpatriotic about that. Just being real. But what we can do is what we're called to do. I mean, look at some of the warnings here. He says, don't turn to the left or right. Be careful to do all that is in the law. Do which Moses commanded you. Do not let it depart from your mouth. Now, uh, does that necessarily apply to us because it's the law? No. We're under the law of grace. But there are certain things that, that apply to us. Faith, hope, and charity. And the greatest of these is charity. Love. Right? And, and, and also Jesus said that we, we are to be a people who speak the truth. If we're plugged into him, then we will share the truth. We'll always be compassionate about it. We'll always be passionate about it. And we will be faithful with it that we speak the truth. And so those are our laws. And we, don't, we do not depart from them. No matter if it might hurt someone's feelings to tell them that homosexuality is a sin. And, I, and you all know that. I used to pound that kind of stuff. I'm done pounding it. I'm not pounding it. I'm just simply making a statement. And living together is a sin. And having sex before marriage is a sin. Those are the things that we need to stand up and talk about. Drunkenness is a sin. We condemn sin. And we do so lovingly. Understanding that we are all sinners. And we are saved by the grace of God. That is, that is our law that's what we're committed to and we don't go to the right of that we don't go to the left of it so can i remind you that the success of our mission is tied to that same kind of truth we must proclaim the word of god to each other to those who have wandered off and to those who have still not heard that is our job we proclaim the word of god to each other mainly to encourage We proclaim the word of God to those who have wandered off to convict. And we proclaim the word of God to those who still have not heard so that they might turn to him. We need to meditate on the word of God. You know, in my Celebrate Recovery step group, uh, we were talking about prayer and meditation. And one of the questions was, how how can you uh, have... how can you have a greater prayer life? What are some of the things that you can do to have a greater prayer life? And, and, and one of the things we came up with was this. You can have a dedicated place to do it. 
You know, the kids know when they come over, at least most of the time. Um, the kids know that there's a spot on the end of the couch that is mine. So when I come in, get up. I mean, I even come in and my wife gets up. My goodness. Um, but I mean, I have that spot. And, and so I have a, you know, I have a spot, you know, out on the deck that I like to set. We have, we have those designated places. And so they came up with one of the things that they need to do is dedicate a place. Well, for me, for me, one of the things I do is do it more. Now, don't, don't misunderstand that. I, I would tell you that to, to, for this illustration that I'm in prayer almost constantly. And I mean that in here and in here. I'm communicating with God. I'm listening to him. But what I do, really do need to do is, is get in the habit of getting down on my knees. That's for my benefit. Getting down on my knees. I'll have to call for Jennifer to help me up. But getting down on my knees and praying to my God, showing him the respect and doing it out loud. See, I know Satan already knows who I am and what I do. He knows who you are. But honestly, Satan sometimes needs to hear us proclaiming our praise and our worship and our adoration to God. And I, honestly, I don't do that. Now, I will tell you this, this meditation part of it, Jennifer can tell you, I do that all the time too. I'll take a passage like this and I'll meditate. You know, Terry and Kathy Goodner, Kathy gave me one of the greatest compliments. I'm almost done, I promise. But she gave me a great compliment at Andy and, and uh, Leslie's wedding, the reception. She came over to me. She says, do you know how hard you've made it to find a church? <laughs> Sorry. You're the ones that moved. No. And, and she said this. She goes, they all, they all stand there and read their sermon." And the only reason I don't is because, I mean, honestly, and, and, and maybe there's a little giftedness in that, and I mean that to, to the glory of God, not to me, but maybe there's a little giftedness in that because I've been blessed with a good memory, at least so far. But I will tell you, and Jennifer will tell you, there are times, there have been times, when I've gone into the bedroom and just laid on the bed and all that I'm doing is thinking about what I'm going to be presenting and preaching and I'm meditating on the text, how can I best bring this text across? Now tonight, I've already told you this, I stole the four things from uh, Crawford. But as long as I say it, it's okay. I mean, it really is. I think. <laughs> So, so meditate on the Word of God. And, and so, you know, I, I basically told him, man, you know, the prayer part I, I struggle with, the meditation, man, I, I seem like I'm always doing that. I'm thinking about what God is wanting to say. So finally, and it's, this is just, this is the end. He says in the text to Joshua, not only meditate on it, not only do not depart from it and proclaim it from your mouth, but do it. Do it. And so as it is with Joshua, God says all that's left is to act upon it. Well, what's, what's left for us? That we go out this door, we depart to serve, that's what it says over there, but we depart to serve um, in taking the message of Christ to our immediate families to our extended families to our neighbors to the co-workers that we have even to strangers sometimes um, let's go do it amen I'm done Father we thank you thank you so much for tonight and we thank you father for 
living in a nation where we do have the right to go and to vote. But even beyond that, Father, uh, you call us to be strong and courageous. And so the headlines of tomorrow or the headlines of next week, they do not move us. Though the mountains may be moved into the sea and though the ground beneath crumble and give way, we can hear our Father singing. I can hear my Father singing over me. It's going to be okay. And so, Father, with that confidence that our future is secure in you, may we go boldly and may we be strong and courageous. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.